happy to to share my uh, in yeah my thoughts on uh, current practices, especially on uh, creation of uh, of data and paradata, uh, and how to deal with this. Um, it's marvelous to do this in this uh, in this capture uh, series because uh, yeah, I uh, really um, always got inspired by uh, these ideas of of your work. So uh, well. Um, let me first introduce why I'm so concerned with, uh, with changing traditions and new technologies and data uh, uh, practices. Because being an archaeologist with an um, artistic background, I specialize myself in archaeological illustration, uh, a really traditional one. And besides applying my artistic skills into archaeological practice, I gradually adopted and adapted digital tools into my existing visualization tradition. And then I expanded these new, techno, uh, these new technical know-how and skills from uh, illustration to research practice and data visual visualization. And this gave way to uh, a PhD position in the project Tracing the Potter's Wheel, uh, which investigates Asian technological trajectories by taking the introduction of the innovative technology, the Potter's Wheel, as a kind of prism to investigate these trajectories to explain not only the traveling technologies, but especially, of course, the people behind it and the contact between uh, communities through time and space. And we did that by integrating three specialisms, an analytical one, more science-based, experimental and digital approaches. And my role in this was to innovate ceramics analysis and enhance the visibility of forming traces in in ceramics. But what I found so surprising is that we can investigate and reconstruct the impact of a new technology on existing potting traditions in the past and know all about the social mechanisms behind it, but lack understanding of how archaeologists deal with the introduction of new technology in their own existing research traditions. So I expanded my research and methodology to investigate Asian practices to study current archaeological practice. And I would like to emphasize here that I use fundamental archaeological theory and not theory derived from computer sciences to investigate these uh, specific mechanisms. So the main research question became, how was the archaeological visualization tradition in general and object-based visualization in particular uh, responded to the introduction of innovative, um, innovative di digital 3D technology and, and to what extent uh, this has impacted current practice. And what do I mean exactly with the technical tradition? It is a, a continuous way of doing things in a particular fashion of this particular way of making in a group or community, whether this is producing parts in the Bronze Age, e uh, Bronze Age Aegean or here uh, at, the, at the university, or how an, an archaeological illustrator documents a pot with a pencil or a 3D scanner. And such a technical tradition reflects the identity of a social group. And my research responded to, uh, in, the, in that sense, my research responded to recent calls from, uh, for a critical theoretical framework for, for a transparent and reflexive digital archaeology. Uh, for example, uh, Bill Carrer, Karar, I never know how to uh, pronounce this, and Colleen Morgan and Sarah Perry and James Taylor and many more. And furthermore, Jeremy Huggett also wondered what changes in perspective offered these uh, these tools and, and, and what this implies for practice, uh, uh, the archaeological practice. And also uh, the position of digital archaeology within the archaeological tradition is still being determined as digital archaeology has been primarily a method and is emerging as a theory, really. And I felt um, that um, a methodology, which I'll, uh, I will present today, uh, may contribute to this emerging theory. But to narrow the debate a little, in a way, um, because it will be really broad to sp speak about the entire archaeological practice, of course. I'm building a fort on uh, Asa Bergen's previous talk in this series, uh, which was more about fieldwork practices. And, um, and I guess I have some similar conclusions and thought on, on the same matter, especially on the part of the impact of technology on archaeological practice. 
And uh, next to that, there's also already a ton of literature about documenting 3D visualization processes, especially on reconstruction and uh, those things. So I hope to contribute to this debate from a, a different perspective and to come with a solution that may even benefit to both worlds. And I do that um, because studies to archaeological visualization have a long focused on the visual outputs as distinct from other archaeological representations uh, as evidence or practice, and often have overlooked visualization as being also socially produced. And this is another uh, point I, uh, I want to stress. Um, but fortunately, over the last couple of years, a growing number of archaeologists are becoming aware of the impact of new uh, technology on archaeological practice and what um, and, and, and that, that we want to assess this somehow. Just as uh, Asa Berggren uh, and other scholars are increasingly um, mapping uh, reflexively their workflows and practices, and this is absolutely great, of course, uh, a, a really a good start. But all these projects do this in very different ways, this, this recording of their workflows and practices. And this diminishes comparability between the practices as they are recorded in these different ways. And not all aspects, I, I think, are, are uh, always included. Um, so an aligned way of charting practices, um, and which are mapped in the same way and taking in, in, into account the same aspects of a practice, allow to assess systematically how, for example, the impact of new technologies on existing practices and to what extent this may have changed. Um, this you can assess it better, hopefully. And around this question revolves my recent past and present research, and I wish um, and I shall address at times, uh, many times uh, in this talk, of course. But to come um, to visualization, we should first understand what the term, uh, what this term actually comprises uh, in, in, in my uh, understanding, of course, and what it means. A visualization functions both as a product and as a practice. And this recalls Latour's idea of inscriptions or um, immutable mobiles. The act of visualizing is a heuristic creative practice of the operating archeologist in which the crafted 3D model becomes an original digital 3D art artifact in itself. Um, functioning and it functions as an active object in multiple domains at the same time. Um, and this will help us to recreate and reconstruct multiple narratives of the past, uh, ideally. The analysis of the process of the creation of a digital 3D image discloses the previously kept concealed construction of the visual output and will reveal its social production. This is uh, a bit contrary to Latour's contention that once the, the, the data is inscribed in the visualization, it actually becomes a material embodiment and really a closed and maintained 3D artifact. And this 3D artifact as black box would obscure the process of digital and analog visualization and the participation of multiple actants in a creative process. Deconstructing the black box of the 3D artifact through the detailed description of the process of creation or the workflow and the acknowledgement of the people and technology involved in this practice uh, would uh, would uh, make this uh, really transparent and translucent, really. Breaking down the steps of the visualization process prevents this black boxing or the production of closed descriptions. The chain, the chaine of retoire approach as applied in the tradition and transition framework about uh, which is this talk about is uh, is in the case of archaeological visualization the appropriate methodology to deconstruct or break down the the chain of creation, including the tools and techniques applied. As a result, the description of the practice has the potential to become a procedure. When successively um, mobilized and accepted by the community, the new procedure is then reproduced um, in creating similar 3D artifacts. Which leads to my final case in point in this introduction. Uh, and that is uh, that I see this uh, inherent human process of data creation. Um, 
although I acknowledge the other non-human inactants as well, such as the machine uh, um, and the archaeological material, with each their own unique affordances affecting the visualization process. That this um, and this whole pro um, practice, if you record this, is the production of para data. And the recording of this practice, um, and and if the recorded practice can become a procedure, can the para data then become a, a protocol, as the title of this uh, talk suggests? Can it? Can the documentation and subsequent uh, publication of Paradata serve as a protocol for fellow visualizers? Not quite. But it did give uh, the title a nice ring, though. But I should correct and nuance it. As I don't need to tell you, but I will nonetheless, a protocol is a guideline that describes in steps what is needed to complete the task. And a procedure uh, is a set of, let's say, um, informal generic descriptions of how you could execute the task. However, the way how you record your practice can be guided by a protocol in this case, in my case, the, the tradition in transition oh, uh, methodology. The recorded practice, the paradata, however, may become a procedure that can be reproduced by others to produce similar data sets. If you record the workflow of similar visualizations, then you wouldn't need to capture every single detail of every single visualization. However, what happens after the production of the 3D artifact, when it will be used and perhaps reproduced, is another matter uh, which I unfortunately cannot address today. But maybe in the next lecture. Um, the tradition in transition methodology allows, uh, as said, the documentation of the creative process and combines reflexivity with praxeological theory, such, uh, such as the Chenoquatoire approach, and provides a profound, uh, powerful method to map this. And the Chien Operatoire allows to compare the technology of material culture, well, it was once meant to do that, to explain social processes. The layered approach considers uh, a technical process as a meaningful sequence of performances and actions on a matter in order to create a thing, whether this is digital, physical, or digital. Uh, a process uh, that is entrenched and occurring within a given, so given social context. These performances and actions are associated with knowledge and technical know-how, and on which the French schools and with the Gosselin, Le Meunier, Leroy, Gourin have studied and published about. In a similar fashion, uh, in the context of digital archiving, the approach can be expanded with conceptualization of archiving practice of Fiona Cameron mostly, I was inspired. Uh, and she states that the collection of data is a series of actions directed to framing the past and making judgments about what should be carried forward to the future. Um, the, transition, the tradition in transition framework conceptualizes archiving archaeologists as making choices and a choice to adapt new technology technology and learn how to use it and uh, create new knowledge about past behavior. The implementation of this framework into archaeological visualization and ceramic analysis enables to map this practice which allows to identify, describe and assess the impact and efficiency of digital technology on practice. And my framework aims to provide a practical and applicable applicable solution also to the um, perhaps maybe ineffective implementations of the London Charter and similar guidelines and is complementary as a framework to the uh, extended matrix due to its specific focus on the details of objects and practice. Uh, this is all great, of course, but how to capture then these intangible or unconscious parts of practice, yeah? the choices and embodied habits and, and, and gestures. Uh, the things Merleau Ponty already noticed that the body, uh, he called it absolute knowing that the body uses uh, contrary rationally reason how um, uh, the, the body knows things. 
that that I don't really anticipate rationally. For example, how to direct the pencil over the paper, determine the angle, and how to draw that particular line. Uh, you just know. Yep, my hands know. So at some point, I know. Um, and the same is with the scanner. I know I know how to position the artifact in the right position for the projected patterns of the scanner and the sensors and robotically adjust the, the focus of these things. Also, if a student asks how they should draw a line or adjust the sensor in the right way, I cannot really explain. I need to show how. My body knows something I don't know. And also Starr and Bauker, uh, they uh, investigated these processes uh, of documenting work in forms and databases. And they also said a lot of the work done goes unnoticed. Some aspects simply cannot be classified and recorded in forms and databases. And I think we need to accept this and that we cannot save and capture everything. We are not scary uh, protagonists in David Eggers' circle. However, circles are useful. Let's have a look why. I have designed a scheme to summarize the tradition in transition methodology and to map such practice. Um, it is a kind of flowchart with, uh, within the operation sequence of archaeological practice. In this example, the 3D visualization practice, uh, which I divided in uh, several stages, such as selection, preparation, creation, post-processing and delivery. And this is by no means a linear process or an isolated one. It's within a social realm. The, the scheme can help us to guide the documentation of this whole process. Uh, and then in a standard way, this enables to compare better different approaches. The circle um, is an enlargement of the little circles in the diagrams, illustrating, um, as you can see here, there are all the little circles. That's the visualizer within its social realm. Oh. And um, uh, to the left, you can see, um, to the left of the circle, you can see the team in which the visualizer, me in this case, uh, participates. So I'm never doing, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm operating the scanner alone, but the whole process, the practice of selecting uh, and the choice of what to document is, uh, happens within a team of stakeholders. The three specialisms within the TPW, uh, so Tracing the Potter's Wheel uh, team, all employ digital methods, such as digital cameras and microscope, as well as 3D techniques. But they are employed to address different research questions with particular visual results within the material, material under study. And instead of replacing an older recording technique, these new digital tools add methods and actions to the existing operational sequence. And photography has been part of the systematic archaeological recording and documentations for over a century now. But the technological innovation of the digital element to photography enables the creation of an unprecedentedly vast archive of ancient forming technology which can both be published in its entirety and publicly. Interesting. uh, interestingly, if you, if you look at the pictures, Caroline here is mostly looking to the screen to see if the photograph is right, if it's captured to the to trace the trace, the forming trace correctly. And she's mainly moving the artifact in the service of the camera vision and is not intrinsically concerned uh, about the material under study itself that she actually already done manually before um, documenting it, which is an interesting shift. Um, these two colleagues prepare a selection of their studied material to let it have scanned by me. So what I can scan is already a selection of a selection of what is determined to be useful to save for the future. Besides, of course, their uh, own documentation of the rest of the material. The selection is based on what the studied material uh, affords. While there are not too much black decoration or too close shapes, but also on the affordance of the scanning machine, the selection of the artifacts is grouped according to size and color hue. The specialists know that, my colleagues, as this cannot be performed in, in isolation. They, they have to know what they can select because it depends on what the machine can rec record. 
And I need to know what they know and want to know. So I had also to learn about pot reforming te- techniques to understand the material. And they had to know, in the other in response, what the possibilities of the scanner is. Now that I have explained the social realm of the visualizer and the digital tools used in the project's research, um, and that is all related to the production of the artifact, the 3D artifact, I will illustrate in detail my own practice with the, uh, with the scheme and how this progressed with the adoption of new technology, in, in this case, the 3D scanner to produce images of small objects. I will show how each stage in the analog and digital practice have changed, if at all, which is possible by breaking down uh, these, 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 uh, the operational sequence into these uh, stages. So to the left, you see uh, current practice with digital tools and to the right, the scheme of uh, production um, of an analog pottery drawing. At first, in selection procedure, not, not really much has changed. Uh, the, the selection uh, still depends on research aims and the selection of material. Although, here you can see at uh, the bottom uh, right that the technology really affects the selection of material, which wasn't really the case with the, with the pottery drawing, analog drawing. Uh, in the second stage, the preparation uh, phase, um, things that haven't been, um, yeah, like choices haven't changed much. Uh, there's still the working conditions and poor light is uh, still also affecting, uh, for example, 3D scanning. The tools may have changed, but we still have to make choices in that. But we have more choice now. Then creation. It got a little bit more com uh, complex. Uh, we had one technique, the T-section for uh, uh, for the pottery drawing. And if I want to 3D scan a pot, there, uh, is, there are more scanning techniques. Actually, there are more scanning methods within the techniques. Um, the actions in this had become more complex. There are more um, settings to choose from. Um, the gestures have become a bit different, as you can see here. Um, if uh, there was a direct interaction between um, the pot and me while I was drawing it, I handled it, I touched it to feel if I could feel uh, details that I could not trace with, for example, the profile um, profiler. Um, I have to hand handle the ruler and other things. But when scanning the the, the camera projector, and there's no direct interaction in, um, anymore between the artifact and me because there's a scanner in between and uh, now the, ge the gestures move to operating the scanner and the mouse and the keyboard and maybe touching the artifact the original original artifact just in the surface of the machine then a stage that really uh, uh, changed actually so not the entire pr practice, but the stage within my practice is the part of uh, of digitalization of which became post processing in the digital stage in the digital uh, practice, um, where I uh, just made a scan in my analog practice and then uh, digitalized the, the the drawing in uh, Illustrator or maybe Inkit, but uh, digitalized Illustrator. There was the mouse. And there were the, the vacuum strokes, maybe, if I use my tablet. Um, then the gestures in the post-processing phase, the, the, the methods became more complex. Yeah, there, there are now uh, multiple uh, software applications that I use. Uh, the, the, the operating procedures like quality control became way more complex than that of a drawing. Uh, um, there's the model enhancement, which is actually manipulation if you simplify a model. Um, there are observations. Of course, I had these also on the, the digital, on the, in the digitalization phase in analog practice. Uh, but these observations were actually already done in um, 
during the, the analog drawing in the previous stage. Whereas now, when I handle the model more the, that I created, the 3D scan, then I make my actual observations because before that, I was only busy in, busy in operating the machine. And I, I like to visualize things. I can tell you here in the scheme what happens, but you can see here, this is my, um, my process, analog process. And you see here, it became much more complex. Uh, with way more actions uh, and choices and, uh, um, and methods used. So in the practice, uh, at a stage, at some stages, there is added complexity, but not fundamental change of an entire practice. Well, um, this is also the case, although less, in the, in the stage of delivery. Um, my, my drawing was done of a pot. It got published then in a catalog. Now uh, there are societal demands, and I have to uh, have to export um, uh, many files so that everybody can use it. Use it. Um, I have to store it somewhere. Uh, it has to be shared with multiple stakeholders. There's may way more communication, and many more people are involved in the creation process. You can see it like this. You can picture the the, the or analog um, pottery drawing but uh, picturing the delivery process of uh, the digital art, uh, 3D artifact is way more complex. There are way more actions to be uh, involved. By applying the tradition in tra transition approach onto my personal practice to analyze how this changed by adapting uh, to the introduction of new technology in different professional and academic environments, I was also able to investigate how investigate, for example, how I transferred my new techniques and methods to students and assistants. I have written in detail my practice down into manuals. That is, I recorded in detail my workflow, which became then a procedure for my peers um, of how they may visualize an artifact if they want. And then to my students really as a protocol, because my students just have to do what I tell them. In order to do so, and to prevent the tools used um, to prevent um, when I was doing this, I also wanted to prevent the tools I used uh, to remain a black box. So you should actually also describe how things of the technical part of the process work as well. I will not go in detail about this, but I just want to mention if I use, of course, um, proprieties, proprietary software because that makes life easier. But you do have to understand how the technology works. And then open source technology actually helps, like uh, scan 3D capture, because then you can actually follow every step of the capturing process. And I think that is really useful to understand. Um, so I'm always uh, trying to, to tell people to, to try this first. It's not efficient, but then you get an understanding of how the machine actually works, what the sensors see, what the, what the, what the pattern projector does and which pat patterns are actually used in the process because this is uh, captured in this in this way all the practice is way more than what usually there are 36 or 68 but these are some uh, nice project uh, projections and then you can really understand all the tiny steps in this process well I don't need to explain you guys this process in detail but that's then how it works, and I, I, I um, document this as well into uh, blog posts and, uh, and part of the manuals, of course. So the digital workflows I created could almost without intervention be adopted and reproduced by the students, almost, because some actions and gestures and particular settings, however, could only be transferred in action, in live action, by showing and observation. And previously in analog practice, these students and assistants would have remained invisible technicians in the presentation of data. And now actually, as we record everything, they are also looked, uh, locked in the metadata of the archeological record, as well as their choices and responses to circumstances while uh, documenting this, this material in 3D. 
So also the, the, the research assistants and, and, and students uh, have become active and visible participants in this uh, archaeological reasoning machinery. Um, and I thought it is important to share with you also. So over the course of um, field work and analysis, uh, my team tracing the potter's wheel uh, had generated considerable uh, amount of data and uh, and a relatively small set of real world, uh, about a quite a small set of actual real world, world objects, um, as well as the contextual information for those files, including metadata and paradata. And what is more is that this added digital complexity in existing technology, uh, technical traditions affects the way resulting digital archaeological archives are organized and designed, and indeed has changed the way data is curated, shared, and published. So how did we approach this? Um, so what we have now uh, is the 2D artifact and the documentation of the process of creating that very art artifact. What do I mean actually with a 3D artifact? I make a distinction between a 3D model as a working uh, object, a 3D artifact as enriched and enhanced ar artifact, and a 3D um, visualization as the creative and cognitive process of generating 3D models. Um, we also have seen when recording the operational sequence of a visualizer, that the inextricable human factor in crafting of a 3D model makes it an inherent subjective endeavor, which makes it an authentic and meaningful object in its own right, eh? the 3D of artifact. And this is great, of course, but as Isto uh, already mentioned in this article, improving the usefulness of research data with better para data, how do we uh, make this data available and useful? Because 3D artifacts are not the end point of research. They are part of ongoing research and future uses, be it academic or non-scholarly practice. Uh, there are a kind of resume, an open-ended entity. This inevitably makes the archive paradox. Archives um, both um, arrest time but also activate data through its subsequent use of ensuing knowledge generation. Um, that being said, they also must be designed in response to these democratic calls from society, enabling full trans transparency of the entire chain of research, rather than a traditional approach of omitting key steps of the research process from descriptions accompanying publications communicate, which communicate findings this also provides multiple entry points into data sets for non-specialists. Um, this is what makes the archive not only a data repository, but an open space for exchange of experience and expertise between specialists. As a dislocated yet situated view of so so um, um, and a place of encounters between human and non-human human encounters. Uh, Leo de Safar, I did not invent it myself. That's uh, from uh, the work of Isto. Uh, the archive is shaped by the practice of the archaeologists um, of archaeologists and choices in selecting, collecting, and documenting artifacts. Archives allow a kind of reverse social engineering. The archive mirrors our practice as Bauer and Starr would stay in their seminal work about framing information work and sorting things out. Each object included in the database has its own solar system of associated data files which provide different perspectives on the object represented. Taken together, these solar systems of data files create a galaxy of relations between the objects. By capturing the information about objects scattered across that galaxy, it is possible to understand some of the key features of it. These data represent a multiplicity of complementary perspectives on the objects themselves. And in effect, data has coll was collected in different formats with several techniques and methods to gain the different insights into the nature of a number of specific archaeological and experimental plots. 
Um, a major difference between this database and others, uh, I think, is that uh, the visual presentation of all these different file form formats side by side, which is, uh, is presented side by side, which is essential for illustrating the complexity of that object. And um, as said at the beginning of this talk, the 3D models are not presented as, as a separate uh, entity then, or for some, some kind of, uh, yeah, separate class. Additionally, the project does, cap does cap capture and present information about different kinds of pottery. For example, the specific needs for presenting an archaeologically retrieved object are different from presenting an experimentally produced object, and as such, the kinds of information which uh, uh, is associated. So my um, colleague, Caroline Jeffra, she also documented the entire um, chain of her, uh, of, of making, producing pots, starting with the tiniest gestures. So she explained all the, um, the ways uh, in production and producing pots in different, uh, with different methods. And each uh, gesture related to, to that particular way of making a pot. And that left particular traces in these pots. And these are all described and connected. Uh, I did the same and oh, now recorded every uh, part of my workflows in different workflows from, from, from scanning a pot to, uh, to, to sharing your data. Um, and in the tabs, and this is this is uh, one of the screens uh, windows within the database. Uh, there are these uh, several tabs here, um, where the metadata uh, and paradata is associated with the primary data, and they are located together and are directly visible. Um, this integrated demonstration of data represents the performative nature of that data and makes it no hierarchical distinction between raw data, technical metadata, or intellectual paradata, as all this data informs its creation and imbues the, the item with meaning. In this sense, there's no real authority over the original of the, over the digital 3D artifact, as the original is simply out of reach for other voices. As you can see here, this is a uh, the remarks during scanning that um, actually uh, one of the students made. So they are visible in our database in the, in the creation of that, uh, of our uh, research in building our arguments. We all did that together. And you can see uh, where she struggled and which may have affected the, the, the final uh, uh, result, visual result. Um, everything is recorded, so also the production of the experimental pots. This is what the public likes most, actually, just watching these, these production videos to find it quite soothing or something. They're uh, filmed from uh, several uh, perspectives, angles, and then uh, the result is presented for many um, here, uh, 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 several sides. And uh, connected is then the 3D model as well. So all the traces in the pot can, can be directly related to uh, particular uh, stages in the production of it. Um, the same counts for my um, analog workflows. I documented that and, and, and uh, summarized it in, in, um, in manuals for pottery drawing. The workflows about 3D scanning, processing, documenting, and sharing are intended to serve as, pro, uh, as procedures. This reflexive descri description of uh, and analysis of, of tracing the wheel's practice of collection and recording of artifacts and the process of translation of the forming traces in artifacts into an archive should become the prototype of an archiving procedure for specialists in ceramics te technology. This prototype procedure can be further refined with the input and experience of members by the community of uh, ceramic specialists. Um, but 
But what I noticed at a conference, for example, eh, when you're building an archive, um, you have to take into account the people using it. But what I noticed at conferences about technologies and digital applications uh, is that it's all about data and how to produce better data and how to document that production and how then to store that data. I hardly heard something about what data can actually uh, represent, what it represents, who it represents, which is in the case of archaeology, usually about people in the past and the people that have studied them and made them into bits of, of data. And related to the notion of data is that of users, the users of that data. And a uh, machine that can find that data for those users, like the fair principle. But Joanne McNeil observed in her book Lurking that persons have become users, which have become dehumanized. We saw it in our, so I saw it as my task, and that, uh, and also my team saw it as our task to disseminate our workflows and findings to people, and not to data or users. But um, despite the good democratic attentions of disclosing archives to the public, how do archaeologists know what non-experts expect to find or want to know? Which information and not chunks of data? And how do they know this archaeological information about awesome forming traces exists in the first place? Because they do not know what forming traces are. And who exactly do the archaeologists wish to reach? The public or an audience is quite a broad definition. So to actually um, include other voices than archaeologists and to create a user-friendly digital system accessible and usable to multiple designated communities, the user rather than the uses of data should, be, should take a central position. My research has introduced professional approaches to archaeology aiming to improve the design, use um, the uses and promotion of archaeological project archives. And design thinking and the academic variant designer thinking and the customized model to create user personas are approaches to facilitate user experience design. The creation of user personas force archaeologists to determine who exactly the audience is and who should use, reuse and learn from the data in order to achieve a truly societal impact. And targeted user groups summarized and personified in a user persona, not to be confused with social groups within communities of practice, also assess issues such as data literacy and internet access. Um, and these latter are, uh, issues are often forgotten while the democratic claims have been um, there because data has been made freely accessible. You know, throw it on the internet and then it's all fine and open and use, uh, usable by everybody. But if your connection is really bad, it's not so uh, uh, democratic. Also, a Sketchfed page which we used, uh, and I'm uh, yeah, a bit uh, ashamed for that, uh, is not good enough. Aside from all the other downsides of commercial pl platforms and, of course, the recent developments. And the most important thing is that it's not tangible, I think which is quite essential in study and learning of forming traces, specifically and archaeological practice in general also. So as Donald Norman said in his pivotal book, The Design of Everything Things, he said, just go out there, do some kind of uh, applied anthropology, bring the, the, the stuff to the people. And which is interesting, uh, I printed, I made the 3D print set, a uh, training set to learn about um, pottery forming uh, traces to recognize these. But if you have a uh, print in your hands, they stay mute. They don't do anything. So you need to integrate that yeah, like, like an object, real object in your hands. It, it, st it doesn't start talking to you. you. You need to guide that somehow. So with these QR uh, codes, they are embedded with 3D models online. Uh, which are tagged, so you can actually then find out what these traces mean. 
which is funny because now the 3D artifacts have become original artifacts on their own with their own interactions and meanings. And students have communicated that the blended approach of the haptic experience and the online 3D model with text and embedded information provided a clearer image of forming traces. Um, and such a blended or rather expanded application of 3D technology in teaching and research is another advantage of the transmission of knowledge to not only students and future members, members of a community of practice, but also in communication of archaeological results and knowledge to a wider uh, audience. And then there's some, some few um, observation about my changed practice, but I shall be fast uh, with this. Um, I already know, uh, showed in the previous slides that uh, my uh, yeah, interaction with, with the object moved from uh, the, the tangible realm to, to, to digital screen work. Um, also a direct visual inspection and interaction to the screen scanner object uh, gestures really uh, changed. I'm looking at that school, but I'm not really looking to it. I'm not really um, treating it as a data object under study. Uh, but just um, trying to, to 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 have it in range, and also looking at the screen if it stays in 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 range for the scanner. We, and the same counts for these um, for the for the stationary scanner, the standalone scanner. I'm uh, robotically adjusting all the stuff uh, without knowing actually. I just know how to uh, adjust all the settings. Um, uh, and I'm not interacting with the object anymore, although I do it here, but that's really in the surface of the machine. However, the, uh, the practice is in transition because um, that it, it did not uh, replace the, the existing practice. They, co they coexist. As you can see here, this is my field work in the summer. I have my 3D scanner. Uh, recording uh, an object which is also there on the drawing. So I do both still. And I must say it's more uh, fast and efficient to draw something than to scan it. The same counts for um, teaching. It's expanded, it's coexisting. Um, although there's an increased direct exchange and communication uh, by this new technology, um, it starts to change processes of technical tr transmission eh, and, and knowledge transfer. And traditional and bleeding edge techniques to transfer skills and technical know-how coexist now in one archaeological practice, um, which I find really uh, interesting. But I shall move on. What I just want to mention is that uh, teachers observed that direct contact, uh, like peeking over the shoulder of the students to follow and guide the interpretation process of archaeological materials with studies is crucial in learning. Uh, students will need, still need to leave the online classroom to have hands-on experience with the material, because if you do it entirely digital, you get the craziest uh, interpretations. So I'll come to my conclusions. And I hope to have demonstrated that we should document practices first and foremost because the analysis of our research strategies, strategies inform design of our data infrastructure as the organization of an archive mirrors our practices. And secondly, it demonstrates the social and technical context in which such procedures take place, showing how the tools and our specialisms mutually affect uh, each other and the, the choices we make in what to collect and study. And by recording our workflows and sharing these through uh, the archive, transparency is provided into how we produce and process our data. And this also um, enables peers to employ the same procedures in order to create data sets to a similar standard, which enhances the comparability between data sets across different projects and avoids the potential for discrepancies or errors in the data. However, um, more data does not automatically mean better data, nor does it mean new information or knowledge. 
a co-creative approach towards data collection and transfer could ultimately change the chain of archaeological knowledge production. The peers and public, specialists and aspirant members of communities exchange data and insights, and this may actually lead to new knowledge, in my humble opinion. Um, another case in point is the title Paradata's Protocol. Yeah. I argumented that the documentation and subsequent publication of Paradata cannot serve as a protocol for fellow visualizers. Uh, yet the documented practice, yeah, that is the process of creation, uh, here is regarded as the two Paradata. This Paradata can then become really a procedure, a set of informal generic descriptions of how a visually, visualizer could uh, execute a task. And when this procedure becomes an ad adopted by other members of the community of practice, a complex social negotiation occurs in which the procedure may become the dominant practice. In this case of visualization, it is more interesting to document paradata in a workflow as this will produce similar outputs, which improves then the, the comparability. Um, this is, in, in my opinion, of course, a more effective approach than going through the paradata of every single 3D artifact uh, to see how the work uh, has been done and read about uh, and read about unique circumstances which you can never actually reproduce. The experiences of all such encounters and circumstances, however, can be recorded and summarized in a workflow and subsequent procedure so that the next visualizer knows how to respond to those conditions. Related to the paradata as procedure and why this is a useful way to document processes in, in a more generic and experiential way, is that 3D artifacts have a limited lifespan. They last less long than their material counterparts. Therefore, recording the practice and the creation as procedure enables to create new 3D uh, artifacts in a similar fashion. Um, however, a note of caution should be considered as the uh, frequent call for standardization of procedures risks the reproduction of more of the same. A similar but not essentially better or new kind of knowledge about the past. Uh, this is an issue of which both visualizing and digital archaeologists should be really aware of, I think. Um, so the analog tradition has not been replaced wholesale. That's my main conclusion. They coexist. And so far, the digital 3D tools we use for artifact visualization have not fundamentally changed practice as they look quite familiar and they imitate existing practices digitally. And this, this skeuomorphic practices, James Taylor and Niccolo Deluto um, published um, a couple of years ago. Also, um, in line of uh, Christian Christiansen, the impact on uh, existing practice um, is that close vision haptic interactions have become different. Different as a more complex tool such as 3D scanner added complexity to the embodied visualization practice. Uh, and uh, it has become more complex because societal and technological demands allow multiple uses and, uh, and users of 3D artifacts, uh, persons, which in turn enrich and imbue the artifacts um, with um, uh, a, a meaning, really. This interaction of everybody with it, with the afterlife, with the 3D artifact, give it a, an actual meaning. So to conclude, in fact, the methodology meets the points listed by Sarah Perry and James Taylor um, in their work uh, in 2018, in their appeal for a, a reflexive theory for digital archaeology, as its flexible design embraces the complexity of practice, recognizes the historicity of data and data visualization practices, considers the social construct of practice, including multifocality and public engagement, and recognizes machine agency and interaction with digital systems. This appeal and other calls imply that the archaeological tradition is in motion due to digital innovations and did not change as the theoretical foundations are not yet determined by the community. However, 
the tradition in uh, transition may enable this. And um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>